Hey, Timberlake, I'm here in our lobby, standing in front of our brand new Timberlake Cafe. It opens this weekend, and all of the proceeds are going to help provide clean drinking water through an incredible organization called Water Ford. Their mission is to equip people to eradicate the water crisis through faith, empowerment, entrepreneurship, and technology. And here's what's incredible. For every $5 donated, it provides 10 years of clean drinking water for an individual in Africa. As you walk up to the cafe, you'll see a pay station next to the cups. Simply tap to donate five, 10, or $20. Suggested donation is $5 per drink. Then simply grab a cup, fill it with ice, and choose a beverage. Beverages will switch out throughout the year. You'll also see a brand new seating area that'll be open not only on weekends before and after service, but also throughout the weeks for connecting during meetings and groups. I hope you enjoy the Timberlake Cafe. And even more than that, thank you for partnering with us in generosity as we provide clean drinking water for those who need it the most. Well, back when my kids were still little, uh, like most parents, I would often read a book right before bed. One of the books that I would read to them was called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. And it's possible you've heard of this book before. Maybe you've read it to your kids. Uh, it's a book about a kid named Alexander who just has a horrible day right? Uh, here he is. He, he wakes up uh, in the morning. He had been chewing gum as he went to bed, so now gum is in his hair. He trips on a skateboard. He uh, drops his sweater in the sink uh, while the water's running, and um, it's just a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And then there's no prize in his cereal. He goes off to school, and he gets the middle seat in the car, which isn't fun. He shows his, uh, uh, his drawing to his teacher, which is an invisible drawing. He imagines it's something, but his teacher won't recognize it. Uh, after school, his mom brings him to the dentist. He has a cavity. She buys him uh, uh, sneakers. He wants them to be uh, colorful sneakers, but instead she buys plain white ones. He gets soap in his eyes when he's taking an evening bath. And, uh, and then to top it off, he ends up selling his cryptocurrency, I think. He bought it in 2009. It was just a disaster, right? But, but here's the deal. In frustration, he, he says, I, I, I wish I, I could just move to Australia. That, that's where I think I, I just want to go. And his mom looks at Alexander and says, well, well, some days are just like this, Alexander, even in Australia. So that's the story. And I would read it to my kids, and, and then I would pull up the covers just underneath their chin. I would pat them on the head. I would turn off their lights and leave them alone in existential despair to deal with life's big questions, right? Well, today we are kicking off a two-week teaching series on the storms of life. So I just want to be really, really clear from the beginning that when we talk about storms, we're not just talking about bad days. We're not talking about just inconveniences or stresses or frustrations that all of us experience. If that's what we are talking about, we would, we would call this surviving disappointments or surviving bad days. But instead, we're calling this two-week series Surviving Storms. So I'm just going to let you know right out from the beginning that today isn't going to be like stand-up comedy and it's not going to be like this feel-good message, but it's going to be a very, very practical message. When we talk about storms that unfold in life, we're talking about those scary uh, unpredictable, turbulent, and overwhelming situations that all of us get confronted with from time to time. The, the situations that have the power to defeat us, that have the power to leave us disillusioned, that have the power to make us question if there is a God, and, and if there is a God, does he even notice what we're going through? The, those situations that leave us with more questions than answers. And the thing about storms is this is an incredibly practical uh, two-week series because here's what we know. Everyone encounters storms. Doesn't matter if you're male or female. Doesn't matter what demographic you fall into. Doesn't matter what your income level is. Doesn't matter if you belong to the Republican Party, the Democrat Party, or if you just like to party, right? It doesn't matter if you're a vegetarian or you have taste buds. Everyone encounters storms. That's important to know. Because there are some people, and they're good people, and they're well-meaning people, they love Jesus, but they want you to believe that if you follow Jesus, your life at some level should be pain-free, stress-free, and problem-free. 
And that, yeah, you're gonna go through difficult times, but if you love Jesus, it's not gonna be as bad as people who don't love Jesus. I'm just telling you, it's not true. Throughout the course of our lives, every single one of us will inevitably encounter scary, unpredictable, turbulent, and overwhelming events that have the potential to leave us feeling shipwrecked or in despair. Less than 24 hours before the crucifixion of Jesus, he's having a meal with his disciples. He's making it clear, I'm not gonna be with you much longer. Here's what you can expect. And one of the things that he says to them in this very critical moment is that here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. He's not talking about, I lost my car keys, kind of trials and sorrows. Or it took them too long to get me my food, trials and sorrows. Jesus was talking about the trials and sorrows that cause deep heartache, deep tragedy. Uh, they, they, they're the deep tragedies of life that leave us disillusioned. Now, there are some storms in life, you know this, that you can actually predict. You, you kind of see them coming your way and you prepare for them. But there's a lot of storms in life that show up without any kind of warning. One phone call can change the next 10 years of your life. Like right now, you could get a text that would cause you to have to get out of here and spend the next hour trying to book a flight to go somewhere today you never intended to go. That's the reality of life. In one season of your life, you can be planning your wedding ceremony and in another season, be talking to divorce attorneys. And in one season of your life, you can be running marathons and in another season, trying to figure out how to live with ALS. In one season of your life, you can be graduating from an elite university. There can be a promising career right on the horizon. And in another season of your life, find yourself being admitted into a memory care center. In one season of your life, you can be sending out baby shower invitations and another season of your life, holding a lifeless baby in your arms. In April of 2007, I officiated a wedding for my 22-year-old brother, Rick, and his uh, love of his life, Kristen. One year later, in April of 2008, I received a phone call that Rick had been killed in Iraq. So now I'm flying back, not to officiate a wedding, but to speak at his funeral. Jesus said, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. There will be storms. And, and the thing about storms is, Sadly, nobody gets to choose their storm. Some of the choices that we make can lead to storms, right? Actions do have consequences, but we don't get to choose what that storm looks like. Infidelity can lead to a storm. Poor financial decisions can lead to a storm. Avoiding responsibility can lead to a storm. But here's the deal. We don't get to actually choose what that storm looks like, how destructive it is, and how long it lasts. So there are decisions we can make that lead to a storm. Decisions other people can make that lead to a storm in our life. And put those things aside, there's actually a lot of storms in life that aren't the result of any particular person or their actions. It's just the result of, of life. And I wish that we could just have a list, right, to, to look at. And we could just say, all right, on this list, I just get to choose my storm. I, I'm gonna choose some sort of trauma. I'm gonna choose the layoff. I, I'm gonna choose the uh, leukemia. That, that, that's gonna be the things that I choose. But the reality is we don't get to choose the storms in our life. We don't get to choose, again, what they are, how long they last, how destructive they are, none of that. That being said, we can choose how we respond to storms. So we don't, have to, we don't get to choose what the storm is, but we can choose how we respond. And because this is actually something in our power, something we do get to choose, what I wanna do is spend the time we have today focusing on how to respond to storms. And obviously, the storms that I'm talking about are the metaphorical storms that we go through. And even though that's the kind of storm I'm talking about, what I want to do is actually look at a real life storm. And I want to look at some of the lessons we can pull from that and how to respond and learning how to respond to unpredictable, turbulent, and overwhelming events that unfold in life. Now, the story of this real life storm that we're going to look at requires a little bit of setup. So I'm gonna set it up and I'm going to encourage you, do your best to engage your minds because the truth is, it's a little wonky in, in trying to understand the details and a little challenging, there's a lot at play. Uh, but the story we're gonna look at is recorded for us um, in a book called Acts. 
Uh, it was written by uh, Luke, who was a first century doctor. Uh, when he wrote these things down, he was not anticipating it to be in the Bible. He was just recording because he was so fascinated with who Jesus was. He, and, and the people who followed Jesus, he, he would just record things and, and it ended up becoming part of our Bible. And, and the story we're going to look at focuses on a specific individual by the name of Paul. Outside of Jesus, Paul is arguably the most influential leader in the history of the church, regardless of where you're at in your faith journey. I'm guessing you've heard of him. So Paul is on a ship. He's there with a couple hundred other individuals, almost 300. Some are merchants, some are soldiers. Uh, There's certainly the ship's crew, but most people on the ship are prisoners. So this is not a Disney cruise. And it's probably going to surprise you that Paul is actually one of the prisoners. He has a guard who's watching over him. He has favor with the guard. So they allow Paul to bring uh, some friends along with him. And one of the friends with him on this journey is Luke. Dr. Luke is a friend of his. He's there as an attending physician, but also as a a friend to Paul. Now, the reason Paul is a prisoner, and this is where the the details start falling into place. The reason Paul is a prisoner on the ship is because of something that happened two years prior. Right? So Paul was in the city of Jerusalem. He's hanging out with some of his non-Jewish friends, and Paul goes to the temple. Now, let me show you a model of the Jewish temple. There are places in the Jewish temple in the first century that non-Jews could hang out. It's called the court of the Gentiles. So the big open areas uh, that non-Jews could hang out. But Paul brings his friends there. And all of a sudden, this accusation arises, this rumor arises that while Paul is here, he brings his non-Jewish friends into some of the areas of the temple that are restricted and are off limits. So Jews believe this defiles the temple. So accusations spread, rumors spread, Jewish People are furious with Paul. They're highly offended that he has disrespected their religious customs and their sacred spaces. And a riot breaks out. And in the midst of the riot, Paul is arrested. Nobody totally knows what's going on, but they know Paul's at the center of it. And then there's this series of court appearances in in different areas that take place. And Paul realizes this is not going to end well. If I'm in front of a group of people who are Jewish, you know, Jewish leaders, or I'm in the city of Jerusalem having to have a trial, it's probably going to mean my death. And so Paul requests to have a trial in Rome. Now, the vast majority of Jews could never do this. They could never request a trial in Rome. But Paul had dual citizenship. He was a Jew, but he was born in the area of the Roman Empire that allowed him to have Roman citizenship. And so he was able to request. He says, I want a trial in Rome. Now, in the ancient world, the legal system was not, or it, what it was, it, it was fast, and it was not, sorry, the, the, in the ancient world, the legal system was not fast and it was not flawless like it is today, right? It was slow and corrupt. And so Paul is under house arrest for two years, which means he, that there's a guard overseeing him and uh, he's allowed to have visitors, he's allowed to do some teaching, but he, he is under house arrest. Well, finally, the day comes where Paul is put on a ship and sent to Rome. And he's put on the ship with a couple hundred other passengers, and they leave from the port city of Caesarea. Right? So so they leave Caesarea. They're eventually going to end up in Rome, which is 2,000 miles away. This took place in AD 59. Now, the reason I give you these details and the reason it's to me fascinating that we have so many details in the scriptures is because it helps us understand these aren't made up stories. Like people reading this could go to these cities. They could say, well, is this true? Did you meet him at this time? Right? It's just fascinating that uh, we have the details we do. Um, and so it takes place in, in the fall of AD 59 and it's the late fall. Well, in the late fall, most ships have been docked. They're not going to, going to go out to sea in the winter. The apostle Paul, not a sailor, but he's been on ships in rough weather. So he goes to the captain of the ship and says, hey, I advise that we do not go uh, sailing right now. This is not good. But the captain and the owner of the ship, they talk among themselves and they just decide we're gonna sail anyways. Sure enough, several weeks into the journey, the captain and crew find themselves in a scary situation. Here's what we read. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor, they sailed close to the shore of Crete, But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. And the sailors, they couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. The gale's just a a strong wind, okay? 
So let's, I know this is a story with a lot of details. So I'm gonna make sure we're on the same page. Paul is on a ship. There's a couple hundred other uh, prisoners on the ship with him. It's sailing close to the island of Crete. Okay? And, uh, and as it's sailing close to this island, it blows the ship out to see this, this wind does, and, and it blows them a little bit south, and, and they start to get near another island, and they're caught up in a storm. Now remember, in life, everyone encounters storms. You're either in a storm, preparing for a storm, or just coming out of a storm. That's how life works. And so I would encourage you today, if you are not currently in a storm, to not disengage, to not check out, to not say this is not uh, applicable to me, because there's gonna be a day in your life in the not-so-distant future, you're going to need to apply the things we're talking about today. At the same time, if you're not in a storm, but you know someone in a storm, I'm going to encourage you to take the link of today's talk and send it to someone who's in the midst of a storm. As we talk about how to respond to the storms of life. Whenever we find ourselves in the midst of the storm, our natural tendency is going to be to respond react, right? To, to let our emotions dictate what's happening, right? So some people, when a storm comes on, they quickly become suicidal or they quickly withdraw and isolate themselves from other people. Some people in the midst of the storm begin to medicate themselves. They act in ways that are very, very reckless. Some people become verbally abusive. Some people physically abusive. It's just, they're scared. They're caught up in the storm and they're just reacting, in a crisis, our tendency is to be driven by our emotions in some way. But often, the best thing we can do when a storm hits, the very first response, not the ultimate response, but the very first response when a storm first hits, is to just stay put. When a crisis hits, we should not make any big or life-changing decisions right away. So for several weeks, the, the ship Paul is on has been caught up in bad weather and they eventually get out of this area by the island of Crete and they end up being blown out to sea and uh, at, after more days of traveling and weeks of traveling they are now right off the coast of Malta another island and while they're off the coast of Malta another storm comes up and this one's even bigger this one's even more furious and it's so furious that those in charge start to panic here's what we read then the sailors tried to abandon the ship they lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the front of the ship. Okay, I don't blame them. This is not day one of the storm. They, they've already been through the horrible weather. They're running many, many, many weeks behind. It's just getting very, very scary. And so the sailors say, we're out of here. They take the lifeboat, they start to put it down and they're pretending. They're acting like they're putting down anchors. Hey guys, we're putting down anchors. Nobody look, nobody look. Cause they're like, we're out and we are not gonna stick with the ship. Well, you know this, it's very common in the midst of the storm to pretend. It's very common to put on a smile and act like everything's okay. Especially in environments where you have a church family. And someone says, hey, how are you doing? It's like, I'm doing good. Bless God, he is good all the time, right? It, it's very easy, it's very tempting to act like everything's going good. But in reality, we're pretending. Sometimes we pretend by overworking. Sometimes we pretend by binge watching uh, TV shows and just checking out of life and out of reality. Sometimes the way we try to escape is by relying too much on alcohol or medication. Sometimes we try to escape through pleasure like affairs. Sometimes we, we turn to shopping or food for comfort. Right? We all have ways that we try to escape. Sometimes we seek revenge. Other times, we, we just try to escape the situation by going on a vacation and just leaving whatever storm we're in and, and thinking, hey, this is going to make it better. I've known many, many couples who are in a storm in their marriage, and they think the way we're going to solve this is let's have a baby. Let's bring a baby into this craziness, right? As humans, we have all sorts of behaviors we gravitate towards when we want to escape the crisis we find ourselves in. And so the sailors are trying to escape their situation. They assume the lifeboat is the solution. Here's what we read. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. Paul says, hey, I see you're trying to escape your situation, but the best thing you need to do right now 
Your immediate response is stay put. He knows our, when we're in a crisis, our first response is let's do something drastic. So I'm just gonna tell you, don't immediately quit your job. Don't immediately say or do something that could potentially cause long-term damage to your kids. Don't immediately end your marriage. Now, when the storm hits, there's no doubt we have to quickly seek wisdom and help and guidance from other people. There are some instances based on the situation that we literally need to get ourselves out of the situation and remove ourselves from the situation for our own safety. But our first response, we need to be very careful that we don't do something drastic or reactive. This is just a simple example of this. Over the years, I've seen people who they... Hours earlier, learned that their spouse has not been faithful to them. And so what happens is they go on social media and they disclose everything on social media and they blast their husband, they blast their wife, and they want the world to know, which is understandable. They're hurting, they're in pain. And I'm telling you, I've done this several times now where I've reached out to the person who posted this on social media. Depending on my relationship with them, I certainly wouldn't do it if I didn't know who the person was. But I reach out and I say, hey, here's, here's my suggestion. I hurt for you right now. I can't imagine the pain you're in. I encourage you to remove your post and to no longer post about this. To just get in a right frame of mind because here's what's gonna happen. If God, by God's grace, your marriage is restored, which I've seen happen multiple times, you're not gonna want all this out there. Also, by you putting this out there, it may trigger your spouse to now take your garbage, whatever that is, and put it out there. And so we have to be very, very careful. We just don't react. And so Paul tells these sailors, don't hit the eject button. And obviously he's earned their trust. He's earned their favor because they listen to him. Here's what we read. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. The only lifeboat there, they let it drift away. In the midst of the storms, let me just ask you, what, what are the lifeboats you need to cut? What potential escape routes do you need to eliminate? Now, it's going to be different for each of us, and certainly uh, each storm dictates what lifeboats we want to jump into. But in my life, I'm just going to tell you, when I've gone through storms, one of the things I've refused to do is cut off my friends. Some people, they isolate themselves, they remove themselves. I've never done that because I know that I need my friends. Another thing that I've done uh, in the midst of a storm or refuse to do is I refuse to go on social media and, and post about it. Now, I'm not talking about like you go through a loss when I lost my brother. Certainly, I posted about that. But I'm talking where it's a revenge type of post. Oh, believe me, I've been tempted. I've been really tempted, especially when people are talking about me. But I've just, I've cut the rope. I've refused to put myself in situations where it's easy to numb the pain through various vices. So let me ask you, what do you need to take off the table so that when you get into a storm, you just know this is, this is not something I'm even going to consider. The second lesson that I can learn from this story is in the midst of the storm, it's very important that I take care of myself. It's very important to take care of myself. See, the storm that Paul and, and these couple hundred people are in has been filled with suspense and seasickness and limited rations. And so I, everyone's pretty much stopped eating. It's been a couple of weeks. They, they haven't eaten. And so Paul speaks direct, uh, directly to them. Here's what he said. Just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. He says, you have been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. When we're in a storm, we're so focused on trying to survive that it's easy to stop taking care of ourselves. Right? In, in, in the midst of a crisis, it feels almost impossible to have time for hobbies or to have uh, time in which we take care of ourselves physically or, or mentally or emotionally. I get it, right? When, when we're in a crisis, we, we, what happens is we become numb and so we check out, we stop caring. But if we're gonna remain hopeful and hopefully at the end of the day get through the storm, we need to take care of ourselves. And one of the things I know is if we are not taking care of ourselves before the storm, it's almost impossible to take care of ourselves during the storm. Last summer, I was on a charter boat on Lake Michigan. Went fishing for some salmon. But before the boat took off, the captain of the the boat got us together. He says, hey, in case of an emergency, I want to let you know where everything is. So he points out light vest. He points out the fire extinguishers. He he points out the first aid kit. 
the, the radio communication system and it was just very basic in how to use it. Even showed us where the flares were. In other words, he did not wait until we encountered the storm to point these things out, nor did he wait until we encountered a storm to get on his phone and order something from Amazon, hoping that it would be delivered by a drone right there in the midst of it. He was prepared ahead of time. So let me ask you a very direct question. What are you doing now to prepare yourself for the storms that will inevitably come your way? Whenever we gather in settings like this, or we engage online, but more specifically, an in-person type setting, when we put ourselves in, in a group and we develop friendships, we are preparing ourselves so that if a storm ever comes, we've at least got community around us. So my wife and I, we've been very open uh, about the fact that we've gone through marriage storms, parenting storms, storms related to pastoring, and specifically many of you, and we've gone through storms. And one of the best decisions that we ever made was 15 years ago when we were just launching a new church in Wisconsin is we started seeking out and intentionally doing our best to develop friendships with pastors who are in a similar season and stage of life. Now, I have friends outside of pastors, um, and, but, but this specific group that I'm talking about, it, it was a very intentional because they're going through the same thing. And over the last 15 years, we have been getting together at least once a year. We, we go to a location, we all rent a, a house together on, on VRBO, right? And we just hang out and we pray and we encourage and we learn from each other. And, and these pictures don't show everybody in the group, but this shows different seasons, different times, but there's 15 of us in the group, 15 different couples. And over the years, we've developed a great bond and the women all have their text chain in which they'll send prayer requests to each other and they'll send Bible verses to each other. And the guys are all on a text chain together and we send memes and jokes and insults to each other every day, right? But for 15 years, we've been intentional in building this community. And there have been times where my wife and I have needed that community in a different way than we needed them before. And there have been times people in that community have needed us. Seen uh, one of our pastor buddies not long ago went through a divorce. It was just a horrific time, but we were praying for him. We were praying for his ex. We, we, we were there in that, that season. And here, here's what I'm gonna tell you. When you got, find yourself caught up in a storm, it's almost impossible in that moment to microwave community. Right, so we all have things in our freezer that it's like, uh, if we run out of something in the fridge and we don't wanna go to the store, it's too late, whatever it is, that we take it out of the freezer and we put it in the microwave. I'm gonna tell you, in the midst of a storm, we do not have time to microwave community, to microwave our physical health, to microwave our emotional health. So if I'm not building margin in my schedule right now, it's almost gonna be impossible for me to find a way to build margin in my schedule in the midst of crisis. If I'm not finding ways to discipline myself and learn to connect with God, whether it's through prayer or scripture reading or even just getting out into nature and clearing my mind and trying to just think about the greatness of God, if I'm not learning to do that in different ways now, in the midst of a crisis, it's almost impossible. So what are you doing to prepare yourself now for the storms that will inevitably come your way? A third lesson that we learned from the story is in the midst of the storm, I need to find a way to give thanks. And I don't feel like giving thanks. I feel like, God, you've abandoned me. Where are you? How did you even allow this to happen? I am your humble servant, and you've allowed this? But here's the deal. It's not because I feel like giving thanks. It's because when I give thanks, I'm reminding myself that even though my world is out of control, it does not mean God is out of control. And so after Paul encourages the passengers and crew to eat, here's what we read. Then he, Paul, took some bread. He gave thanks to God before them all, and he broke off a piece, and he ate it. And then everyone was encouraged and began to eat, all 276 of us who were on board. In the midst of the storm, Paul is intentional about thanking God. He's, he's finding the good. He's reminding himself of where his hope is. 2017 was the most challenging, difficult year of my life. I went through storms in the church I was pastoring, storms in my marriage, storms in my parenting. It was, it was destroying me. I will say this, that in the midst of all the craziness that was going on, and I did not respond correctly to everything. There were things I was reacting to, but here's the deal, I can tell you this. In the midst of that storm throughout that year, I would regularly pause, focus my eyes on God and take time to express gratitude. There's a song that 
was put out by Elevation Worship years ago that's called Do It Again. And I would go to a, a room in the, the church I was pastoring and I would go to a room and I would put on this song and it would be on repeat. And I would begin to literally pray the words of the song. Your promise still stands. This is the chorus. Great is your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. And I would just say over and over, God, you haven't failed me in my marriage. You haven't failed me with my parenting. You haven't failed me in, in the church. You have been in control the whole time, even though it feels like my world's out of control. And so Lord, I'm asking you to give me the strength to get through this. And the good moments that I've had in the past, Lord, I'm believing that they're coming back. And they did. And what happens is when we thank God in the midst of the storm, it doesn't make the storm go away. But it takes our focus off of the storm and it places us, places our focus onto the God who is able to protect us and sustain us during the storm. Well, there's a fourth lesson uh, that we learn from this story. And it's that during the storm, I need to find ways to hold on to whatever I have to hold on to. I just have to hold on to whatever's there. Now, as a reminder, the ship is sailing, I mean, it's very close now to the island of Malta. Everyone on the ship knows it's about to run aground. Those in charge are starting to put down anchors. And here's what we read. But they hit a shoal, a shallow, ground, a shallow part of the ground, and they ran the ship aground too soon. And the bow of the ship stuck fast, while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and began to break apart. Full on crisis. Everyone's in panic mode. They know disasters here. Everyone's terrified for their lives, but those in charge are terrified that the soldiers are gonna use this as a, a way to escape, which is a legit concern, right? Back in uh, 2010, uh, Haiti had a 7.0 earthquake and 4,000 prisoners escaped from one prison because they, they saw it as an opportunity to get out. And even just a couple weeks ago, there were people, gunmen who walked into two different prisons and 4,000 escaped. Like they take advantage, uh, prisoners do, of a situation like this. And so it's understandable that the soldiers in charge say, man, if these guys escape, it's our lives on the line. So here's what we read. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul. God had given him favor. And so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land. The others held on to planks or debris from the broken ship, and so everyone escaped safely to shore. Some people swam to shore. Those who were too exhausted to swim, those who were unable to swim, they grabbed onto planks and debris to, make it, uh, debris to make it to land. So relatable, right? Storms impact people in different ways. And there's gonna be people in the midst of a storm that hits you where you're just exhausted and you feel like you can't make it. They're gonna say, well, I was able to get through that season and I was able to find the help I need. I was just kind of able to swim to shore type of thing. And that's great. Not everybody can do that. Sometimes we don't have the strength to swim to shore. And so we just need to hold on to the planks. We need to hold on to the, we need to hold on to whatever we have to hold on to. If you're depleted, maybe the only thing you have to hold on to is your church family. And gathering together on a regular basis and saying, this is getting me through. Maybe it's, it's music that points us to the greatness of God and, the, and, and to the faithfulness of God. Maybe for you, it's a, it's a healthy habit that you've developed in your life and it's provided some sort of consistency. And you say, in this season, I'm just gonna keep doing this habit. It's very difficult, but it's, it's gonna get me through. For, for myself, I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's words of encouragement. Because when storms hit me, I get very, very discouraged. I think almost every pastor wrestles with discouragement. And so over the years, I've, I've kept every letter and every card that has been sent to me. And I keep them in this acrylic box and I'm telling you, in the midst of the storm, I often go back to these cards and I start to read them. And I start to remind them myself, like, hey, it may be bad now, but we're gonna get through this. And just because I feel like worthless right now doesn't mean that it's, it's always gonna feel like this. And so for those who have sent me a card, and so many of you have been so welcoming, it's, it's in here and it's almost full. So I'm gonna start a box with just gift cards. That'll be my next box that I start. <laughs> Maybe it's reading scripture. I think for all of us, it ought to be reading scripture and filling our minds and our hearts with the faithfulness of God, reminding ourselves of God's character. In fact, the author of Hebrews writes about the character of God. And then after writing about the character and faithfulness of God, the author of Hebrews writes this. He says, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. This hope, the faithfulness of God I just talked about. 
the character of God I just wrote about, it's a trustworthy anchor for our souls. So you may feel like your life is being torn apart today in a bunch of broken pieces. I want you to know God can get you to your destination. And if you've been hit by a storm or a series of storms, I know it's very tempting to not engage in environments like this, to not engage with your church family because you just feel like my life is a mess. And I want to remind you at Timberlake Church, we embrace the mess. We actually run to the mess. We know life is messy. We know it's difficult. And so we want to be a church that stands alongside of you and prays for you and encourages you. That's why we have groups. That's why we have a prayer team. Right? This, is, this is why we gather together regularly. And in the midst of the mess, I want you to hear this. There is always hope. Hope doesn't mean that everything's rainbows, unicorns, and cotton candy, but it does mean that even though it feels like the world around me is falling apart, I'm confident that God is still with me and God is still for me. So Paul eventually makes it to Rome. He spends two years on house arrest. And during those two years, he writes several letters to followers of Jesus living in different areas. Those letters eventually became part of our Bible. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. And it's fascinating. We really don't know how the story ends. The the book of Acts, it just kind of ends. We don't have the the end of the story. But we do know that Paul's time in house arrest in those two years was not wasted. I mean, the letters he wrote, we would not have them if he was not under house arrest. And what's fascinating to me about this story and through the entire journey that should have been three or four weeks long, it ends up taking almost six months, maybe even a little longer than six months, that Paul throughout it all stands out from everyone else on the trip. And in the midst of panic, he seems to be very grounded. And those in charge are drawn to him and they're seeking his advice and they're seeking his wisdom. And here's the deal, Paul's human, he's scared, he's emotional, but he has a faith that impacts how he approaches the storm. The reason he had strong faith is he had been through difficult times. I'll close with this. Almost everything I've learned personally about the character of God has been learned in difficult times. When I've been lost and confused and everything seems chaotic, I'm gonna tell you, that's where I've learned God is my shepherd. When I've gone through seasons of loss, that's when I've realized that God is the comforter. In my seasons of pain, in my seasons of difficulty, I've learned that God is the healer. In seasons of weakness, I've learned that God is my rock and my strength. So Jesus says, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but he doesn't stop there. He says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. In other words, you're gonna go through it, but I am with you and I am for you in what you are going through. So my hope is that all of us, when we go through storms, will come out on the other side. I do realize there are some storms that seem to last for a lifetime. In which case we say, God, may the intensity of the storm die down. Things like mental health, that may be a storm that just goes on and on. May it it, it die down. And may all of us, when we see someone else going through a storm, may all of us be the kind of friend that steps in and says, I'm gonna encourage you, I'm gonna be here for you. Let's pray. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that when we go through storms, you are very aware of what we're going through that you see us, that you notice us. We pray today for our friends who are in the midst of a storm, a a, a storm of sickness, a a storm of uh, a parenting storm, a marriage storm, a storm where it just feels like everything's falling apart. And in the midst of the storm, may those going through it experience you and know you in a real way and in a personal way. Help them to get through to the other side. Help all of us when we're in storms to be able to focus our attention and our minds on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. But before you go, please be sure to bookmark this page so you can find us again next week. And are you looking for a way to get engaged and join a team? The online chat engagement team is a role that anyone and everyone can do. And it's simple. Engage with people. Create an environment where people are free to be themselves and more importantly, open to receive the truth of Jesus. And if you're interested in joining this team and becoming part of what God is doing through Timberlake Online, please let me know on your connection card. Links can be found in chat and I'll see you here next week at online.timberlakechurch.com.